Hello, everyone who's here. I hope you're all having such a wonderful day today. Welcome to History 1301. We are going to be studying the first half of US history this semester, and I hope that we're just all excited to learn more about that. I am joining on my phone to make sure that it's looking OK. I'm going to turn this off. OK, because I am going to put the PowerPoint on. All the way. From the start and let's just hope that it all looks good on this end. OK, well, I hope that everyone is having a wonderful day and that your semester has started well and that you are just excited to learn more about US history this semester. Even though we're on this virtual format, I hope that you're still going to be getting a lot out of this course and enjoying the material that we'll be going over. On my end here, it's showing that the PowerPoint is still, there we go, it is going okay. All right, perfect. Well, I, if you have any questions, please put in the question and answer portion of the chat that's over on the sidebar so I can see what's going on with that here and I can answer any questions that you would have that you might have. So we are going to be starting on the coursework today and we're going to get going by talking about kind of how did individuals come to the Western Hemisphere? How did they get here? And we're going to be kind of just considering some of those questions. And, you know, it's really fascinating because I think to do this, we have to rely as historians on oral history. And that's really hard for a lot of historians to do because we're very used to have like wanting to know the truth, right? We want to know the truth and when historians use then historical documents to do that. And so this is the period before the written word. And so I think it's kind of difficult for historians to grapple with that a little bit to kind of have to be more interdisciplinary and look at things like anthropologists and their work and archaeologists work and it's it's just an interesting kind of intersection of a lot of just different disciplines and I think historians get rather uncomfortable with that but it's okay and I think sometimes it's all right to just kind of go into the unknown for a bit and learn more about these other disciplines as well and kind of like what do they have to teach us and what can we learn from this so today we are going to get started and it's called the first American people's migration settlement and adaptation and to get started we need a little a small I would say story to get us started I mean all good all good things start with a good story right so let's listen to this story in the beginning according to a Native American creation story the whole world was dark people lived in underground in blackness they did not know that the world was dark because they had no knowledge of anything else no one had ever taught them about the blue sky world after a long time in darkness the people began to get restless some asked is this all the world there is will there never be another world a mole came to visit them digging his way through the darkness with his little paws and sharp pointed nails the old man asked mole is there more to this world than this my friend You've traveled far and fast underground. What have you discovered? Is there anything else? Follow me, said the mole. The people lined up behind Mole and he began to dig his way upward. As Mole clawed away the earth, the people took from his little paw hands and passed it back along their line from one person to the next and the next to get it out of their way. And that is why the tunnel that Mole dug upward for the people was closed behind them. This is why they could never find their way back to the old dark world. Okay, I'm getting nervous now that I'm on mute, so I have to go back and double check. Okay, I, I'm fine. I just, uh, I had to double check now because I've done a few of these now and I ended up being on mute. And um, that is not fun to have to go back and re-record the whole thing again. So I am redoing this now, don't worry. I just had to double check. Okay. Stay from Korean side. All right, okay, at last, at last. Mole stopped digging and the people came out into their new world. Light shone all around them and washed them like a blessing. The people, like the mole, were blinded by the light. They were afraid and hid their eyes to protect their sight. While the people were standing there, um, while the people were standing there, 
a an arguing what to do they heard a woman speaking behind them be patient my children she said and i will help you take your eyes away, uh, take your hands away from your eyes but do it slowly slowly now wait a minute move them a little bit farther away now do it again and again four times the people moved their hands away from their eyes and at last their eyes were freed and open and they could see a little old spider woman grandmother of the earth and all living things she showed them corn and how to weed and hoe and water it she told them to go live near the turtle mountain in the south but they were not sure where that was the old spider woman told them when you find signs of your two friends again mole and me you will have found your place for a long time they wandered and wandered here and there they endured hardships and quarrels about what to do finally only two were left a man and a woman they journeyed southward over a hard rock then they saw a strange animal crawling along look what a strange track this thing leaves in the sand they said and they remembered that they had seen those tracks before they look like mole's tracks he said and she said the back is as hard as the stone and it has a design carved and painted on it that's grandmother spider web and then that moment they knew that they had found their home. So this is an origin story from the Pueblo Indians in and that lived in the Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico. And this is how they understand how they came to their homeland. And I think if you listen to this story and if you kind of ponder, it might have some kinds of correlations with other origin stories that you might have heard, even things like the um like a kind of a biblical things as well. We think about like a man and a woman, darkness to light. There's some elements that might be familiar. So it's interesting that a lot of these oral histories, I think, could have some interesting intersections if we kind of sit down and compare them with maybe some other stories that we might have heard. When I was in Wind Cave in South Dakota, okay, I was making sure it's not Wyoming, South Dakota, um, in Wind Cave, our tour guide was a park ranger and she was the Lakota Sioux and she told an interesting origin story as well and it's interesting because in that story they came out of the wind cave so again like the darkness to the light and all of that's kind of playing together here and I think that that's kind of important for us to think about like what does that mean what was this darkness that individuals came from and and how is how does that kind of maybe represent a past versus future and all of this coming together so migration this is like stories of migration speaks from coming from darks and distant lands why and how do these things kind of like then resonate then with other origin stories we think about a lot of this migration and settlement and adaptation is essential then to human history there's a lot of stories like with fire and irrigation working with metal this all of this is a response into the environments in which people live in and this helps then kind of develop regionally specific cultures in different places. So the first people in the Americas, um, where did they come from? Well, like I said before, historians use written text. So without that, historians are kind of at a loss of what to do. So uh, like I mentioned before, we have to rely then on other disciplines to help us kind of at least hypothesize what happened. How did people get here? So this is going to help describe then human history and its origins. And this is combined then with stories like these oral histories to help us kind of help uncover the past. I mean, what can we, can we truly know everything? No, but we can definitely piece together a lot of the story here. So physical anthropologists posit that the first humans came to the Americas about 13,000 years ago. And as you see, they're coming then from Siberia over to the Americas. So let me see if I can get my pen. As you see, coming then from this area over here, over this right in here so that is kind of what's going on so then the groups would then splinter and evolve as they began to then move south as you see some are going to be going down south and these are really interesting pathways that they will then develop and of course adapting then to the physical environments that are going to be around them so for much of history and prehistory then and this is the term that we're calling this period here there's going to be a really slow and very very slow dispersal of humans that are going to spread around and then um basically as the sea levels are going to fall this exposed then this land bridge that allowed then humans to cross over here 
And that is going to expose more land to, to settlement, basically. People are going to, some people both in from um, Asia into the Pacific. Others are going to, and even down to Australia, right? Others are going to then go in this land bridge that's called the Beringia Beringi Land Bridge from Siberia to modern day Alaska. And this happened to um, these um, physical anthropologists, I believe around 12, 15, uh, 12,500 to 10,000 years ago. And dental records show that the individuals who lived here closely matched those then in Northeastern Asia. So then this kind of connection then perhaps can be made between these two different groups. And many American Native Americans that live in this region still today have type O or A blood. One of my dear friends is an Inuit member. She lives in Nebraska now, actually she just moved. And she's from Alaska though, was born in raised in Alaska and I asked her and she has type O blood. So it's, um, I, that, again, one anecdotal story to help us um, piece in these puzzles here. Now, there's a lot of kind of material evidence that are in these places here. Think about things like stone tools or fired pottery, burial remains, but organic material does not really survive very well, especially up in this region. We'll talk about kind of how it is kind of a lot of it does get lost. So scholars know more about how early humans hunted, how they prepared their food, but, but they, they don't really know a lot. Like, what did they wear? What was their thoughts? What kind of homes did they live in? That's kind of less known for us nowadays. I mean, carbon-14 dating is helpful, but um, it can measure anything that was once alive. And a lot of this, though, is kind of going to be in the tundra up in places like Alaska. So it is not going to be readily available anymore. So maybe someday we can increase our knowledge a little bit more. Here's a, an image here of this land bridge that, that individuals cross to get over to what we now call Alaska. Now, there's going to have a lot of um, frigid ocean waters nowadays. There's going to be a lot of different boundaries and mountains, but it was apparently not always this way. When it's covered with ice sheets, it was a little bit easier than to walk across. And as the climate cooled, much of the Earth's water is going to be trapped in ice. And so the lowering levels of the Pacific by about 360 feet, they believe, during this time, that exposed this Beringia land bridge. And and um, there's going to be this about thousand mile wide land bridge that is going to connect Asia and North America. It's cold enough to grow um, glaciers, but too dry during this period. And this kind of exposed in grasslands that were in here, big refuge then for large animals, think like mammoths and horses and saber tooth cats, bison, caribou, all of that. And some have compared this to like an East African savanna. And so the humans that are going to be crossing over and living here, they're going to use fire, but they also are going to hunt and gather as well, or gather and hunt, since many believe that most of calories actually come from gathering, not hunting. So it really should be called gathering hunting. So for men hunted, women gathered. Anyways, so what's going on then here there are many are going to find these corridors and begin to move farther south and there's multiple routes some believe that maybe they took boats part of the way or maybe they just walked all the way to different places ending up down even in locations like all the way down south like Clovis, new mexico so what does this mean in uh, in Clovis, new mexico they have found a fluted stone spear tip that believe, they believe is about 13,000 years old. And there's similar ones in North and South America as well. The large mammals begin dying off due to the climate change. The enormous ice sheets are melting and it's going to be giving, like there's a lot of flooding then, so people are going to be moving. Now they're going to begin hunting other things, not just mammoths, but some smaller mammals, some smaller comparatively, I guess, because things like bison, they're going to um, not domesticate things like like horses or camels those are not domesticated and so they are not and they end up not surviving anyways 
So these first people are going to have to adapt to their environment a lot. They are going to start living more in families. They're going to be moving seasonally to get better food sources, start taking up agriculture, and that is going to make society more complex than and larger, make society more larger and complex. Others are going to stick to hunting and gathering. So this, or gathering, yes, gather hunter, this archaic period is going to last um, to about 7,000 years, and it's in many different places and kind of different times as well. Many people start establishing then year-round settlements as well. It's with these growing populations, it's harder to be more mobile and kind of moving and sustaining that. Also during the archaic period is when dogs are domesticated. And I know people always um, love to think about humans domesticating dogs. It's kind of a fun thing to think about. In Mesoamerica, there's going, they're going to start focusing on raising things like turkeys for food, macaws and parrots for um, their feathers to decorate things. And most are still hunter-gatherers or gather hunters. Many are going to start hunting with these things called an atolatl. And so as you see here, it's kind of like a spear-looking thing. And then you would have something in your hand that you could use to then flick that to make that projectile go. So you would do use that. Now, it is going to be something that is apparently quite accurate. And also, it it doesn't really matter how strong you are. So when I was in the Badlands National Park, a I think it was actually a forest ranger came to do a demonstration about atolatls. And it was interesting because we all got to kind of like throw them and try them. And that was my first encounter with using one of them. And it was interesting because like some of the really big guys in the group didn't actually go as far as a, like I would say rather diminutive woman who threw it and she actually went farther than everybody else. So it kind of showed that it took a lot of skill to do this. And and my, um, there's a guy apparently who makes replica ones called Adelato Bob. And my, my husband really wanted to buy one for our house. And I said, well, why? And he said, for home defense. And I said, we are not getting an Adelato for home defense. But I would love someday to maybe like do a demonstration of something like this and be able, you know, they have axe throwing places. Why not Adelato throwing? Someone needs to, some entrepreneurial student here needs to get um, get that started. and I, Or at least petition maybe to add it to these axe throwing places that we see popping up all around town. Okay, I digress. Get back to back to the subjects here. So in Northeastern America, they start using large earthen mounds then for things like burials. And then in Louisiana, there's going to also be, be mounds. And some are as tall as like 25 feet. Now, what did they use for? We're not entirely sure. Burial, living, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Now, we're moving on, though, to the development of agriculture. The methodological kind of development of, and cultivation of food crops is going to happen around 2700 BC. So around 2700 BC. And in the Americas, we're going to see a lot of corn. So maize or corn. And that cultivation is going to be then around, and that was around 2500 BC that we see this cultivation beginning. In American Southwest, we also see things like squash and beans around 1500 BC. And as the, these groups became more settled, there's health benefits to that as well that are going to be, if you have like a stable food source, but also they're losing other health benefits. So think about like being mobile, you're getting away from like human waste and things like that. You're agile, you're smaller groups, it's easier to go. So, you know, there's pros and cons for each kind of way of life. There's also really low fertility with um, with these groups. Late people are living into their 30s. Um, I'd be like um, about to probably, I mean, be in like my last, you know, my, my golden years right now at this point. And they had about two to three children. Many people are going to be living in more southerly places. Think about like for climate, that makes a lot of sense for us. And they believe that um, at the time of first contact, first contact with um, Europeans, there was about 50 million people. And only out of those 50 million people in the whole Western Hemisphere, only 7 to 10 million of them lived north of what would today be Mexico. So let's look at how these individuals, oh, um, by the way, there's like a theory that we didn't cultivate corn. Corn cultivated us as humans and that corn is the thing that's like spreading and so anyways there's my big bad corn if you just I mean, you can look up this this theory a lot of my students think that it's a little far-fetched and then after like reading all their ingredients and they see corn and everything they start saying like maybe maybe dr north maybe you do have a maybe you have a point with this so let's look a little bit now at the different societies that lived and again this is just kind of a 
quick overview of a lot of the different societies that lived in the Western Hemisphere. So the Maya, the Maya are living in what is now Central America. And if you've ever taken like an ancient history class, you might have um, learned about the Fertile Crescent. And this is very similar in many ways, kind of this densely populated area with a lot of political and economic and social change. The Mayans are going to be very um, flourishing from about 150 BC to 800 CE with a population. And CE is referring to common era. You might see um, BC and AD, or you might see BCE and CE. Those refer to the same years, just um, different ways of, of referring to them. So in case you're wondering, I remember when I first started, I think it was high school or college, I had no idea what any of these words meant. And why like some years went backwards and other years went forward. For most of this course, for basically all of this course, you don't have to worry about numbers going backwards. So that's kind of nice to know. And I was like, did they did they know that the numbers were going backwards? I mean, was everyone just kind of counting down for that? That's that's kind of terrifying, I would think, if you're like, oh, this is year three. But they did not. That was a that was placed upon them later. Okay. Anyways, um, to continue on, they had a an advanced understanding of planets and stars. They had a calendar that was based on the solar year, and they looked at time as cyclical. And they're going to carve accounts on these slabs that you um, you might have seen in museums or in, I would say, even like maybe like Mexican restaurants. Sometimes they have these kind of like same kind of motifs up in there. And now you'll see that and you'll be like, oh my goodness, this is Mayan symbols that are going to be a carved accounts that are going to be once adorning palaces and temples and pyramids. And now it is adorning this delicious establishment that I'm going to to eat at. You know, great. Um, they were dedicated to gods and they believed their gods demanded sacrifice. And you know, if you believe this, you better do it, right? Because, you know, you never know. You never know what might happen if you don't. Tikal was a very important city for the Mayans. It was a center of trade for things like flint and jade and granite shells, obsidian. And they are going to then be able to kind of um, expand with who controls these resources. And they also are going to have a very important to control for these sources of cocoa as well. And these seeds are not just currency, but basis for a delicious beverage that only the like ruling elite really could probably afford to have. And if you've ever been to any place and you see any like a Mayan hot chocolate or Aztec hot chocolate or any kind of things like that, I, I definitely recommend for you to try it. You might have tried it yourself and you know what I'm talking about. It's not very sweet because um, like like sugar hadn't been brought over to the new world yet, if you will. And so it's, it's very, I would say sometimes spicy, but really incredibly flavorful. So here's, yes. And there's a place in Taos, if you ever are in New Mexico and like driving, I would highly recommend, I think it's called Choctaw actually and it's um you can drink that beverage there and it's incredibly rich so get like a very small size and and try it so if that's ever on your radar you let me know how you enjoyed it please email me and tell me all about it all right so there's going to be a devotion also for this god named Quetzalcoatl who we'll see and that's kind of part of this you know legend with Hernan Cortez which we'll be talking about probably in a future lecture Priests are going to have careful records of seasons and tributes and all of these things. So there's going to, to be all this record. Now, this kind of these, these civilizations, some collapse around um, 650, but then by 900, the Mayans are really on the decline. So you see the years here, they're definitely on the decline by then. They're going to be really eclipsed. Oh, this is kind of my funny thing here because we see like the Mayan hieroglyphics and then our use of like emojis. Do people still use emojis today? I don't know. It's kind of my question right now. Ask a question. I can ask a question to those who are here. Do people still use emojis today? I don't even know. Okay. Oh, and this is um, an ancient, this is a city that's near present day Mexico, Mexico City. And this flourished from about 150 to 650 BC. I don't, I don't think I've ever actually been here, but I would love to at some point. I have been to Alton Ha, which I believe is a modern day Belize, and that was a fascinating place. It just really shows you like how big some of these cities are. So if you're ever, I don't know if you ever end up going like on a on a cruise and like everyone's like, we really want to go zip lining or we really want to go snorkeling, you'd be like, no, I want to see the Mayan ruins. Definitely. That will be you'll be the 
most favorite person in the group in. And I do hope that you have an opportunity to travel to some of these locations and definitely like say no to the other excursions and go see the Mayan ruins if you if you ever get a chance. And again, email me and tell me how it was because I want to I want to know about it. OK, we just talked about Quetzalcoatl. We'll be back to this now. Huitzilopochtli is an important god for both the minds, but really we kind of see this more than with the Aztecs. And this is an incredibly like bloodthirsty god. So the Mexica and the and Tenochtitlan, so after the kind of fall or at least decline of the Maya, we are going to see then the rise of the Aztecs who are going to come to central Mexico around 12 hundreds and there was a lot of perpetual war they believed that they were a chosen people they believed that this god Huitzilopochtli told them to build a city whenever they saw an eagle perched on a cactus eating a snake and I know a bunch of you are like I know exactly what you're talking about and why because that is of course what the image that you see on the modern day Mexican flag so in the 1400s, there's a lot of conquest. Now, they have very strict militaristic rules. If you were drunk, you would be enslaved. You would actually be killed if you're a repeat drunk. Can you imagine? Like, I wonder if that actually would deter alcoholism nowadays or if people would just drink and silent. I'm not really sure. Thieves and adulterers were also executed. Very hierarchical society as well. So there's a cult around their god which demanded human sacrifice. And previous societies on occasion had done this, but this is definitely like next level kind of sacrifice. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, so very, um, very much next level. So this is a cult kind of around this human sacrifice. Now, they believed that it kept the sun rising. So would, could you really risk not doing it, right? So basically, they would hold a person kind of over the stone, stone slab, and they would slash open their body with a subsidian knife and remove their still beating heart and then throw it in a cauldron of fire. You kind of see, like, the hearts floating up here, which to me is rather, like, alarming to see. I think I would definitely be, like, getting out of there. And then they would toss the body down the temple steps as the next kind of victims are coming up. I don't think there's enough fear in the looks of these victims here. Personally, I don't, but, you know, I can't imagine anyone would be kind of like having a smile on their face when they would be like the next ones going up, probably. You know, probably these are the priests. That's why I'm, I'm just now seeing this. The, the, the victims have already been thrown <laughs> up. There's no more line of victims than with those. Yes. Okay. So. During the inauguration for a great temple in 1487, more than 20,000 people were sacrificed in four days. Like, that is a lot of sacrifice, right? For 20,000 people in four days. I mean, like, you'd be cutting hearts out. You'd be getting, like, your arm would be getting tired from cutting out. I bet they had to, like, switch. No wonder there's so many priests in this image because they had to switch out, like, tap out. I, my arms are sore. So um, most are conquered people. And to me, that's probably not endearing to your neighbors if you're conquering them and then you know ripping out their hearts probably so this kind of helps maybe what i call foreshadowing there that there's going to probably be some disgruntled people who are your neighbors and you just don't probably want to always do that to your neighbors so they have a populace of about a million people which is really really large for this time 300,000 people were in Tenochtitlan, which is their capital city, and they can only supply about 5% of the food they needed. So you had to then get a lot of imports all the time. Pros living in a city, I mean, there's a lot of pros with that, but then cons, like you can't actually feed yourself. So if there's a siege or anything like that, it would be pretty difficult. So the empire is going to spread a lot. Oh, I thought I had another side for that. The empire is going to spread a lot, but people get destroyed disgruntled, right? And there's only so much you, like conquering you can do to actually have an effective rule over um, individuals. So we're going to leave the Aztecs for a minute with Montezuma as their ruler, and we'll be back to them, don't worry. Heading farther down south, there's the Incas. And as you see here, this is Machu Picchu. And one of my life's desires is to someday visit Machu Picchu. So um, I'm going to put that on my bucket list. I would love to be able to do that someday. I have a baby now, so I'm wondering, like, at what point it will be okay to take her to Machu Picchu. Like, if anyone's ever traveled with babies, please reach out to me and let me know. So this is going to be the last and most extensive American Indian empire in South America. And they're going to emerge in central Peru about 1200 CE. And they're going to build a large empire as well on the basis of conquest. And they dominated nearly all of the Andes mountains. And each king believed they were divine. And after their death, they still had this kind of like cult and a mummified body and all of this stuff. So this incentivized wars of conquest then as well. 
Now, they tolerated other religions and they brought then elites into the state. So this way they're able to kind of compile knowledge and do all of this. And they are going to excel in organizing and centralizing a very sprawling empire out there. The Inca state controlled the economy in this region, and they had systems of warehouses. They actually had about 14,000 miles of roads that they had, and they were very well maintained with a system of runners and packed trains so that they could move messages and they could move supplies. They also had a really lovely system of irrigation to grow and kind of make this, this all flourish, growing corn, peanuts, cotton, all of that stuff. Now, they had no formal... And they also had human sacrifice, as you see the maiden is here, but it is actually incredibly like much more rare compared to someone like the the um sorry, but someone like the Aztecs. They had no formal writing system, but they had these things called kipu that we see here, which is a system of knots that are going to signal things that are counted. And it is actually um it is a really amazing and fascinating system as well. A few years ago at the Dallas Museum of Art, they had an exhibit about Incan art and, and artifacts and they had some examples of Kipu and it was really, really neat to see. Okay, so they had millions of people as well within this empire. Okay, oh, here I am in 1998. My grandparents actually taught in a university in Lima, Peru, and my grandma was asked to go give a seminar. They had moved back at this time, and they asked to give a seminar in 1998, and I went with her down there. I was homeschooled for a year, and I know you're looking at this girl wearing a, in the left picture a fanny, uh, a panda fanny pack, and you're like, she was homeschooled. Wow, she looks so normal and cool. Yeah, so there I was in Peru. So, anyways, I would just like wander around this university while my grandma was giving a seminar, and these were actually Incan ruins that I found. I guess I found. I think I found like a kid that was walking by, and I said, "Take a picture of me," and like climbed up, and I was like going through this. I think I fancied myself some kind of like Indiana Jones going and looking at these things all by myself. Anyways, um, we're going to go farther north now, though. We're going to go and learn a little bit more about the people who lived in what is modern day, like modern day United States. So if we think about the agricultural like Southwest in this kind of region here, we probably would think like it is hot, right? It is hot and there's always going to be this need to get like water and food. So it's a complex society, but it's less populous than what we saw like in Central and South America. And we kind of have to think then about how does like climate shape these cultures and what sets these groups kind of apart. So the Hohokam are going to be individuals and um, the Hohokam and Anasazi who are going to practice agriculture in this region, as you see that the system of the, these kind of this irrigation system and canals, and they are going to um, kind of have then this reliable water system because of those canals and those irrigation things. They raised corn and bean and squash. They gathered wild plants as well. They ate antelope and deer, and they lived in these kind of like sub semi-subterranean homes as you see right here where it would kind of like be able to go down thin and so it would kind of be a little cooler one would imagine they had an export which was turquoise that we see here and they had about 50,000 people who lived in this region and so if we go back here this is going to be where the Hohokam are more in here like um southern what would now be Arizona so they also played this interesting game and they, they found about 200 of these ball courts remaining here that were dug into the ground that is going to have like a rubber ball that is going to be like in these kind of slightly oval ball courts or so about 65 yards long with these large like hoops or rings and they, they would seek then to kick these goals and everything now they're going to abandon these uh these locations in for these houses these like larger houses here and this is these adobe homes and these great homes like the casa grande which is going to still remain with us today and flood swept a lot away a lot of this work in the second half of the 14th century and so we we don't have too many representatives of this and the Sonoran Desert would not be inhabited again for, for quite a while. At the same time, the Anasazi are going to be very skilled stonemasons, and about 5,000 people lived in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And one of the kind of center of the sprawling network is Pueblo Bonito. And here they're going to also have these semi subterranean kivas in which they are going to live and, and worship and all the things there. They also had a system of dams, dams and ditches and canals as well. And if, um, if you ever have gone to Southwest 
Southwest Colorado, you'll see some lived in these cliffs, in the cliff dwellings. This is my niece Addison, who's now 13, who would be absolutely mortified if she knew that there was a picture of her with her little Junior Park Ranger badge and here wearing a Hogwarts shirt. Oh, makes me happy. Um, so this is the, these were cliff dwellings. We went and visited there one summer and uh, she got a, to be a Junior Park Ranger. And this is also my thing, if you ever, like when embarrass your kids someday, make them when they're young, go and become junior park rangers at these different sites. So um, they're going to, um, these cliff dwellings are absolutely fabulous to see too in Mesa Verde. All right, and um, there's gonna be a lot of these roads and connecting all the way down to Pueblo Bonito as well. And a lot of the roads in there are gonna emanate out of Chaco Canyon. There's not enough water they believe and so around 11, 50, 18, 11, 80, they were going to be forced then to move. Um, and they believe that these are then the ancestors of the Pueblo Indians. Moving up kind of more, I would say, north or northwest-ish is the Great Basin. And these are going to be the ancestors of the Utes and Shoshones, and they are going to be moving in, and they are going to rely on things like these kind of potato-like bulbs and pine nuts. They're very skilled basket weavers as well. I mean, think about like how long did it take to make these baskets? I mean, so, so long, right? And they are going to also be practicing agriculture. Probably, I would say like a very iconic group that we might be familiar with if it's gonna extend all the way down into modern day Texas, and many of us are from Texas, are going to be the Great Plains Indians. And humans and bison developed together on the Great Plains. The bison was a source of lean and flavorful full meat. I've never, I'm a vegetarian, I've never had bison, but I've talked to several who have, and they said it's, it's pretty good. And it then is going to be then a supply of fat, but it also have the hides and the horns and the bones. You might have heard at some point that they are going to use the entire, that Native Americans use the entire buffalo. And from what I've been told, that is not 100% true. Some things are going to be, you know, much of it is used, though, is the point. And yet, we, we you know, we can, like, acknowledge that, that it's probably some of it is okay to also, um, maybe not keep, but using as much as you could, right, as, as much as, as possible, basically. So they are going to develop some of the most stable societies in the Americas, and these are going to be these small bands of hunter-gatherers for about 2,000 years. And about 250 um, CE, they are going to adopt in the bow and arrow, which could help kill bison at close ranges. And so apparently to hunt, they would construct some kind of corral, and one would yell in a way a distressed bison would, and then they would come and be able to slaughter dozens at a time. And I think, oh my goodness, these sweet bison with all this like empathy, and all they want to do is save a fellow bison, and then they get killed. You know, what is this? tell us about life or whatever. I don't know. Okay, so um, moving a little bit. Oh, wait. I'll stay here for a second. All right. So some groups are going to be planting as well. And basically, this is going to be in this region. Now, going to the Pacific Northwest, this is a place I feel like I would have loved to inhabit at the time for some of it, because there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of water, a lot of like fish that's around. And I feel like like stable food source, stable water sources, those are all wonderful. Now, um, that's kind of the Pacific Northwest. But all the way up here, though, it seems like it'll be very, very cold. So the Aleuts and the um, Inuits are going to be living in what is modern day Alaska. And little really is known about the people who settled in here. They are going to be coming from the area that we call, that we know as Siberia and settling in here. They're very skilled in, in like kind of water craft and whale skin for clothing, hunted all kinds of marine life, and building homes from like whale bones and driftwood as well. They had a very stratified society. Now, Alaska's remoteness, but also the forest cover makes archaeological work up here rather difficult. Um, it's believed that in the in the summers, living on these more coastal villages, and then other seasons, moving into more like these semi-subterranean homes that were insulated with sod and fur. They also carved ivory, which we can see kind of a representative here, a really beautiful piece that's there. Now, going a little bit farther down, I feel like this, like a little bit more temperate climate, but also that abundant uh, sea life, but also water. This kind of seems like the place I would want to be out of all of this. And so, and also this seems like a potlatch ceremony, which is basically like a um, big, you know, coming together and eating to celebrate things. I'm all about that life. 
There's going to, okay, so this is in the Pacific Northway. Salmon is the mainstay of the economy here. That makes a lot of sense. They actually would dry them and pound into flour then for later use in the salmon and around because they, you know, they're so abundant and then would have like a period without. So it's pretty fascinating to think about. Down in California, there are going to be about 300 to 350,000 people, which is interesting because that's how many like live in a very small, small time part of California now. That's across this entire state. And they are, there's more than 100 languages. It's very decentralized in a place like California. There's also plants and like individuals also ate these acorns, but they of course are poisonous. And so you actually have to um, dry them and like pound them and bleach them and then um, wash them several times to remove the poison. And I just wonder like who decided to do this several different times before and then be like, oh, okay, it won't kill us now. Like how, how did they do this? So baskets are so finely woven in these regions that you could actually like would hold water, which is amazing to think about. Kind of one of the um, the last kind of in this West Coast region is going to be down in Hawaii, which is, of course, also a state in the United States. Hawaii is going to be Polynesian culture, and um, many like people were kind of wondering, how did people ever get here? They are going to be part of the Polynesian Triangle, and they canoed and got all the way to Hawaii, so the Polynesian Triangle ranging in a, um, to from Easter Island up to Hawaii and then down to um, down in the west here is kind of a very large region. So getting to Hawaii. Now, many are going to say, wow, this is where I would live. But there's also volcanoes there and it's a very stratified society. So unless you're on the top, it might not have been the best life for you as well. They will have bring food and animals with them. Only bats are actually a certain bat is native to Hawaii, but they are going to begin to plant and things are going to grow really beautiful there. Taro, sweet potato, bananas, breadfoot, breadfruit, yam, coconut, fish, waterfowl, all that kind of stuff. And so they are really, like I said, hierarchical as well. Now, as you see, the groups that we're probably going to be first encountering in this class, if you think about like a migration starting in the East Coast and moving, some of these groups are going to be more isolated from European encounters initially, and it will take a little time before they are going to be more directly affected by that versus the woodlands area it is basically going to be affected pretty much right away, this Eastern woodlands. So this is kind of this forested Eastern half of the United States. So some of them, like the Adena and Hopewell, have very small agricultural settlements. What some of them actually have the largest earthworks um, constructions kind of ever. There are going to some of the remains you can still see today. A lot of it were victims of um, urban development, much who were destroyed in the 20th century. But some say they might have been burial mounds. Others say maybe there were astra, uh, astra like kind of for astronomy to be able to like see down or something to be able to, you know, communicate. Who knows? Who knows what they're for? So um, they're very skilled in producing textiles and ceramics as well. Now, the materials for these kind of things come from a large, large region. They found in these kind of remains obsidian from the Yellowstone, grizzly teeth from the Rockies, mica from North Carolina. So goods kind of coming in, but goods going out as well. Very large trading networks that were developing here. The first city in what is now America was Cahokia. Cahokia was the first city in what is now America. And this is going to be a place that this region here is really rich in game and plants and waterfowl, all of that. The soil is really good for agriculture here as well. And it had the largest population outside of Mexico, somewhere between 10 and 30,000 people. Again, much smaller than like Tenochtitlan, which had 300,000 people, much, much smaller, but still like the largest city in what is now America. And this flourished really from 800 to 1200. One of these mounds was over 30 yards high, which is an incredibly tall thing. It took it took um, 22 million cubic feet of soil, built one basket of earth at a time. I mean, that, that's just wild to think about. And so some of them are tombs. In one tomb, they found 260 victims that were supposed to accompany a dead leader to the afterlife then. These are going to be abandoned though about 1300. Now, um, the first now group that we see here is that, that we are going to initially maybe be familiar with from early American history are the Iroquois speakers. And they're going to live near, um, kind of near the Great Lakes, little east to the Great Lakes in upstate New York. They cultivated corn and they're really involved in competition and warfare in this region. 
And they are, um, we often see a lot of like cycles of violence here and villagers falling upon other villagers and the cycle of violence and these, these revenge wars and this thing called mourning wars where you'd actually take and capture individuals from other tribes and bring them in to replace people who had died from your tribe. So it's, a, it's this kind of constant violence here. And one of the region, one of the um, leaders from the Onondaga, so you see these are the different tribes then that are, are going to be kind of part of the Iroquois eventually here um, are going to um, and this is um, Hiawatha is from the Onondaga so kind of right here in the middle and he had suffered greatly he had actually lost three daughters to these wars and he is going to then meet with Saganawida who was a prophet and his words are going to lead Hiawatha then to um, stop this cycle of violence and share beads with one another to make a great council with these different tribes. And so that will then lead to the to the five um, the five tribes of the Iroquois League, which includes the Mohawks, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca, and later um, the Tuscarora as well. So this is called the League of Five Nations. Really, there'll be there'll be six in the end. This is going to be the most um, powerful. This is going to be the most powerful nations in the northeast part of the United States. These towns are matrilineal, matrilineal, meaning that the kind of inheritance actually is going to be passing from the maternal side. So you might know your father, you might be you know, involved in his life or whatever, you might be aware of that. But a lot of inheritance in that stuff and a lot of your like, guidance in your life would then come from your mother's side. A lot of times your mother's brother was a really important time uh, person in, in your life. And those have some have said that really the only person, the only male relative that you have that you can guarantee is related to in a time before DNA testing is your mother's brother because individuals saw your mother birth your 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 grandmother birth your mother and your uncle then as well. So women cared for the longhouses. Some of these longhouses were a hundred yards long. They are going to plant and harvest corn and beans, squash tobacco, watch children, craft clothes and pottery. They had a lot to do. These women had a lot to do. Men are going to be preparing cornfields for planting. They are going to catch fish, hunt, war diplomacy. All of that is what they're doing. So married company couples would then live with their wife's family. And then, like I said, from your mother's brothers where you'd inherit your property. All right, the last kind of group where, that I'm going to mention today is the Algonquian speakers, which are going to be the group that we'll probably first encounter in this class. And so we see individuals are going to be living on the Northeast, all the way down to the Chesapeake, which again is this region that the English at least will first kind of encounter here, including the Abenakis, the Wampanoags, all of that, Shawnee's Fox, and we'll also see um, many other tribes in the beginning. These communities are smaller. Many of them are living in kind of dome-shaped houses, living in these kind of seasonal camps then. And each group, though, if we think about, and we'll get far more into this as we kind of continue on in our lectures in the next few weeks with the different kind of encounters then that we're going to have with um, the English then and the first tribes that they are going to be meeting. So we'll uncover this a little bit more. Just know that this is where the Ungon Queens are, are going to be living and we'll unpack this more in the next um, couple, couple um, lectures. So what we kind of want to think about then is that each group is looking for places to live, right? like habitable places to reside. And so think about like, what would prompt someone to move from one place to another? And how does conquest and absorptions of diverse people kind of change over time? So these are things that we're gonna be grappling with this semester and thinking about a little bit more. Thank you for coming to my first lecture. And I hope that you all have learned a little bit something new. Again, it's kind of a fast and furious look at at this time period, but it kind of it sets our stage now. It's going to set our stage a little bit more for the upcoming lectures to come. 
let me see if I have any questions in here as well. Thank you so much for those who have uh, been putting your comments in. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And I look forward to getting to know you a little bit more throughout this semester. I will be posting different times that I'll be going live with my lectures. I'll be posting these lectures throughout the time. Just let me know if you have any questions. And I look forward to learning more about history with you all throughout this term. Goodbye, everyone.